Welcome back. I'm David Knight, and joining us on the phone now is Ammon Bundy, son of Cliven Bundy. And, of course, he and his brother and his father and many others have been suffering as political prisoners. We had a turnaround in that case. We were following it for quite some time. We had uh, Sherry Duvalli, who was reporting on site uh, there every day of the trials, and we were uh, getting updates from her as this was going on, and we're very happy uh, to see that they are out. But there are still people who are in prison who have been convicted and who have not had their convictions overturned. And that's what Ammon Bundy is joining us today to talk about. But we also want to find out uh, how uh, they are doing and uh, uh, find out uh, how uh, his father is doing. Uh, the, the brutal treatment that they had uh, there is another uh, part of the story. The long time that they were held in prison as political prisoners, the harsh treatment that they went through. And we saw this on um, his Facebook uh, page. They have a Facebook page at Bundy Ranch where there are updates, and if you want to get that information, uh, you can get that there. But he wants to get information about those people who are still uh, being held in prison, and the government hid evidence that would have, I believe, uh, allowed these people to be set free, just as the uh, judge decided. And again, the, the federal prosecutors were still coming back to this judge here six months later, after she had dismissed this case. First, she said it's a mistrial because of information that came out from whistleblower. Then six months later, they're coming after she said uh, she was going to dismiss it. They're still trying to do this. So joining us now is Ammon Bundy. Thank you for joining us, Ammon. Thank you for having me, David. Uh, First of all, how is your father? I'm so glad to see that you guys are out, uh, some of you anyway. Uh, How is your father doing? Because he was, uh, you know, he's in his 70s and he was going through this brutal treatment. It's brutal for you and your brother and others that were there, but especially for, to him, I think. Uh, how is he doing? How's this help? He's doing well. I mean, he's, you know, gained gained uh, weight back, healthy weight back. Uh, he got down to skin and bones in there in prison. Um, and he's, you know, back to working. He he loves to work, and he's, you know, running, working on that ranch. And, uh, you know, he's 74 years old, and he works like he's 45 years old. So I got to give it to him. I hope I could do that <laughs> when I'm his That's age. That's great. Yeah, hard work is has been the thing that helped him to get through that ordeal. How long were you held in prison before the trial? Nearly two years uh, we were mm-hmm. held in there. Uh, much of it was in solitary confinement. You know, there was some terrible things that they did to us. They, they, you know, broke my tooth, two, both front teeth. They broke my, put a, chipped my hip. Um, wow. Blew my, blew my eardrum, just things like that, just from the abuse in there. My dad got an infection in his jaw. He ended up losing most of his teeth. Was and this done to you by the prison guards, or did they have other uh, inmates yeah. do it? They uh, were the most, ones who chipped your hip and uh, the, yeah, damaged they, your eardrum? I had two men kneeing me at the same time, and one was, a, and I'm not exaggerating, he was close to a 400-pound man, and another one was a, you know, good, uh, a good-sized man. And they need me at the same time. Um, both oh. one on one side, one on the other side, and it, you know, it either broke a chip or a, a cartilage in my in my hip, and it still floats around in there. And I actually then they threw me in solitary solitary confinement, and uh, didn't give me medical t- medical attention for over forty days. Well, you clearly were political prisoners, and we have seen this type of treatment. Uh, I've covered many uh, trials. Uh, we have the. Uh, case of Ross Ulbricht uh, that they have now got serving uh, multiple life sentences because he was running a website and they had criminal agents involved in his case. Once they have a situation where somebody is doing something that they want to shut down that activity and make an example of people, that's when you see this type of action taken against people. Uh, The extreme punishment, the harsh treatment, uh, keeping people in jail and hiding information from jurors that would release other people. I know that's what you want to talk about first, so let's go to that right now because there were there was a previous trial to this one uh, where you had a hung jury, and it was in the course of this second trial, correct me if I'm wrong, that you had uh, whistleblower information that showed that the FBI and the uh, BLM and the Department of Justice uh, were lying about things, that they were hiding information, and I think that was what uh, turned the hand of Judge Navarro, wasn't it? Because she'd presided over these other cases, cases where people are now uh, currently in prison, right? Yes, that's correct. So there was a first trial, and, uh, well, so there was 19 defendants, or excuse me, 29 altogether, 
but and they broke us up into multiple trials. The first trial, uh, they did not allow any of the Bundy family to be part of that. They were just people that came to support and help our family, and mm-hmm. um, and they literally just steamrolled them in that trial. Uh, you know, would not allow them to talk about the militarization of the BLM. They wouldn't allow them to talk about the BLM agent conduct while they were at the ranch. And I'm talking about, you know, the gang beating of my brother when he was just trying to film them, uh, body yeah. slamming of my Aunt Margaret, you know, the killing of the cattle and digging mass graves and leaving the baby cow out on the, on the, in the desert just to die. Um, uh, they didn't let and that's why we about, went there to cover know. it because we felt that they were on the verge of setting up another Ruby Ridge or a Waco or something. They were getting so aggressive and violent with people. That's why we went out there to try to shine some light on that and make sure that that didn't happen. And I was there, and I, you know, I know that the people who were protesters there, they were not aggressive. It was the people with the federal government that were aggressive. Uh, the other yeah, they, people that were there were were peaceful protesters. Yeah, they actually uh, reached out to uh, our family with a liaison for the BLM, and they told us in that conversation, it was a long, about a 45-minute conversation, but the, uh, the the agent speaking to my brother said that if we resisted in any, any way, this would be another Waco or Ruby Ridge, and then later on in the conversation, he says, they will kill you, mm. and so absolutely, and, mm-hmm. and you know, there was, there was tremendous uh, misconduct that was going on, you know, with the BLM for, you know, for example, like underneath the wash there, you were down there, you were covering it. Yeah. Um, they were fully militarized, pointing oh, yeah. their weapons at us. And then some of the things they were saying were things like this, uh, and this was caught on body cam and dash cams, uh, things like mother effer, you come find me and you'll have hell to pay or quote, this is a shoot first and ask questions later situation. And then yeah. one BLM agent, speaking of a man with a dog among among the protesters, says, shoot the effing dog first. And then another agent says, speaking of an overweight woman, says, shoot her right in the effing forehead. And then they all start laughing. And, mm-hmm. and later on, they said that, oh, that under this search situation, they were in tremendous stress and they were afraid for their life. Well, they were pointing the guns at the people and laughing and saying these comments. And yeah, they were they were on the loudspeaker, uh, the the bullhorn, uh, telling us to go back. They were going to use lethal force and so forth. There's a, fo- a Fox News reporter who was there, and he was very afraid. He was trying to get over to their side, and he was as he was walking towards them, they were making threats against him. I've got video footage of him pulling up his shirt and saying, "Look, I've got nothing except a video camera. Don't shoot me! Don't shoot me!" I mean, clearly he thought yeah. they were going to shoot him. Uh, we had some people that were up on the bridge who were not down there at the wash saying, "Oh, that's not happening." Uh, no, it was happening. You were there. I was there. We heard that. Uh, I didn't hear what they were saying on the body camera, but uh, it was uh, touch and go there for a while. And I had uh, uh, some individuals down there who were former law enforcement who said, uh, we need to get as many people down here because they're getting spooked and they're going to start shooting. That was really what we thought was going to happen. When we come back. We're going to talk about the people who are still in jail and what needs to be done to get them out. Stay with us. Be right back with Amon Bundy. Welcome back. I'm David Knight, and we're talking to Amon Bundy. We just had, again, on Tuesday, we had prosecutors, federal prosecutors, still trying to come after the family after the judge there dismissed the case back in January. And what she said, I'll repeat this again, Judge Navarro dismissed the conspiracy charges uh, against uh, the uh, four men on trial. Of course, that was uh, Ammon Bundy, Ryan Bundy, Cliven Bundy, and another individual uh, saying the prosecutors had acted, this is the judge's words, with prejudice throughout the trial. She said the court's findings of outrageous government conduct was not in error. On the contrary, a universal sense of justice was violated by the government's failure to provide evidence that is potentially exculpatory. In other words, would show that they are innocent. She said they didn't bring any new arguments. They just keep coming back after this. And this is the relentless persecution and hatred that was evident by the BLM before this happened. And they these people were political prisoners, as you heard some of the stories, and, and Ammon just uh, touched on some of the abuse that happened there, uh, violently attacked in prison by their jailers, uh, held for two years before they could get a trial. As uh, things were building to a head there before the standoff, everybody knew that they were uh, building for violence. They had uh, set up sniper 
uh, areas uh, that were there at the time that I was there and uh, talk about murdering the people there. And, of course, they eventually did kill Lavoie Finnegan. Uh, this is not just threatening talk from these people. They actually did eventually murder someone who was doing a protest. But I want to get some facts about the cover-up because we've still got people who are in jail. we still got the prosecutors still trying to come after these individuals where the judge shut this down. The judge's hand was forced by a BLM whistleblower who exposed information because the judge was complicit in this cover-up in the previous trials. Uh, there was a previous trial of these four individuals, and there was a previous trial of a lot of others. Some of them are now in jail. So, Ammon, uh, tell us some of the details, uh, some of the information that needs to get out to the public that is still not getting out to the public that would release the individuals who are in jail. Tell us some of the things that they did. Okay, so, again, in their trial, the first trial, they would not allow them to, again, talk about the BLM conduct, you know, the BLM uh, abuse. They wouldn't let them talk about the snipers. They would not let them talk about the militarization of the BLM. All the things that brought these good men to the ranch, they would not allow, allow them to talk about it. Um, but in specific, the, they would not uh, allow them to talk about the snipers. And the prosecutors actually lied and tried to cover up that there was even snipers at the Bundy Ranch. And let me give you some actual uh, quotes from their words. So Stephen Myrie and Nadia Ahmed, who are the U.S. prosecutors on this case, uh, they said in, in the indictment, so they said this, quote, Bundy family members, particularly their wife Carol, broadcasted messages and images into cyberspace, falsely depicting BLM law enforcement officers as snipers and claiming that the BLM was using military-like force to threaten them and confine them to their ranch. This propaganda, and more like it, spread quickly through cyberspace. Then later on, the prosecutor said that in, in the indictment, quote, that the investigation to date reveals that the BLM has no snipers and no established perimeter, even in or near the Bundy family or property. Now, you know, David, that that's a lie, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they mean, had, uh, you saw them, probably. Yeah, that's right. We saw them. We didn't get film of them, but we saw them. And we had people that were telling us, hey, we uh, dumped some stuff into their foxhole, their sniper uh, uh, nest. You know, we, we dumped some stuff there last night when they were gone. But, yeah, it was happening. They, they, it was there all the time. And they said that we made this all up and that we said it, spread it all throughout the, you know, uh, social media to incite the people to come, that this was, you know, that this was, that there was no BLM snipers and that we made it all up and that it was propaganda. That's what they told the grand jury. That's why the grand jury indicted this in the first place, because they said that we made this whole thing up about the BLM being militarized and have snipers on the hill and surrounding the home. And then so, at the standoff, the fact that uh, you had people who had firearms on their horse or firearms on their hip or whatever, which is legal to do that, uh, not pointing them at the BLM as the BLM was pointing their weapons at us and threatening to fire. They showed that one picture of the guy that was up on the bridge down behind the uh, concrete not clear who he's pointing at, but there was an individual who took that picture, and when they asked him at the trial, there's that picture. When they asked him at the trial, uh, you know, where were you? Well, he was crouched down. See the people crouched down? Who are they afraid of? Are they afraid of this guy with the rifle, or are they afraid of the uh, other people that are down there that are threatening to shoot people? And they wouldn't allow them to they, – they shut down the lawyer, didn't they, uh, Ammon, uh, when he said uh, – uh, well, who were they hiding from? Oh, you can't talk about that because the answer, the obvious answer to that was they were hiding from the BLM. Yeah, they wouldn't rifles. let them talk about anything that the BLM was doing. They wouldn't let them, you know, say that there was literally, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 BLM agents with yes. uh, rifles pointing guns at them. Yes. And, yeah, there's some very interesting facts. In fact, uh, that was not allowed in the trial. One of them that you just brought up, that individual pointing that rifle, uh, the FBI went up there and did an investigation on it. So we're talking about the FBI, actually. And they mm -hmm. said that there would be no way to determine that he was pointing that rifle at uh, a federal agent. And they also determined that there was no way that he would have been able to point that gun through that, barr that barricade like that was in the direction of the BLM officers. But they wouldn't allow that in the trial. Wow. Wow. See, that's amazing. I mean, that's what they wouldn't allow. You know, now, back to the snipers and them saying that it was us that brought this all, that we were uh, spreading propaganda. 
because, uh, David, there was an actual deliberate cover-up by the prosecutors to try to scrub all the evidence of any snipers, BLM snipers. And let me just tell you about one. So uh, in a 302 report drafted by the, an FBI agent, that's basically FBI's report, Agent Brunk from the BLM report the following, quote, on April 6th, Brunk observed the confrontation between law enforcement officers and Ryan and Dave Bundy. Brunk was acting as a spotter observer for a BLM sniper. So that's what he says in his own report. And nearly, then, it, then nearly a, later, a year later, Steve Myrie, who was the U.S. prosecutor and on this case, he called Agent Brunk back in to change his report. <laughs> and uh, it, it literally says, the new report said the following. After reviewing the SD302 report, that's the FBI report, Brunk made the following clarification. In paragraph three, Brunk advised that he never acted as a spotter observer for a BLM sniper, nor did he ever tell the FBI that he acted as a BLM spotter observer for a BLM sniper during his original interview. Wow. So he's See, this is what we're seeing with Peter Strzok and these other individuals I, that has now come out, that, and they're, again, it was politically based, just like your trial was politically based, and we're going to talk about the political basis of this in the next segment, because I we need to get this story out there, because... Your father and your family are constantly slandered uh, by the mainstream media as welfare ranchers. Nothing could be further from the truth. That makes me incredibly angry. I can only imagine how it makes you feel when you hear those types of charges. You're fighting for our freedom. You're fighting for my freedom. I understand exactly what you guys have done, and I really do appreciate what you've done. But when we see these FBI agents, we know that in the case of President Trump, they have changed their statements to mm-hmm. to get other pe- to to cover up for some people or to make other people appear more guilty and they did the same thing in your trial. This is a systemic corruption throughout the justice department, the FBI and so forth. This is this is something that is systemic. This is not isolated to a political attack against President Trump. It is systemic against anybody that they perceive as an enemy and that includes you and includes people like Ross Ulbrich and others. Anybody that they single out yeah, it's rotten from the top and the bottom. It really is, and it is not isolated to the Bundy Ranch or to, to President Trump. You're exactly right. The, the tactics are the same, and what they're doing, what they're doing to us is is basically denying justice. And yes. when a people when a people feel like they're denied justice, then they lose complete confidence in in the system, and That's then right. other things happen. We don't want that to happen. It- Exactly. It's a very corrupt system, and it's got to be fixed. And we're going to talk about the other part of the corruption and what the BLM was initially doing when we come back. But we also have specific plans about how to help these people in prison. We'll talk about that as well. Uh, Ammon, let's talk a little bit about Todd Engel, Greg Burleson, uh, still in jail, even though they pulled the same stuff with them that they pulled with you, but the whistleblower's information broke when you guys were in the middle of your second trial. But these guys were convicted. Uh, railroaded through the system, and they are still in jail. What can be done about that? Well, David, the the judge clearly has acknowledged. She acknowledged it when we, in our trial, she said when when all this stuff was uncovered, uh, she because the prosecutors were lying to the court as well. When all this was yes. uncovered, she said men have been convicted because of this information that was withheld. Well, we thought when she said that, then this whole case is blown up. Even the previous trial, those who were convicted. Of course, because all of this is flickled to both, both trials and to all, all the defendants. But they're still in there. They've been in there for seven months. So that's my problem, David. Here we got a judge who is acknowledging misconduct, cover up, you know, and yet we still have men in prison. Why has she not released them? That's, a, that's an injustice in itself. Does and she so have the power I- to do this? Or is this something that the Justice Department has to do? Because they came after her again six months after she declared a mistrial and tried to get her to overturn that. Uh, can, no, does she, she have the power to overturn she, their convictions? Yes. I'm sorry I interrupt you, but she, yes, she has jurisdiction and, and just has set on the, on the motion uh, to dismiss. She's just set there on them and has not ruled. So she has full power and, and jurisdiction to release these men and has not done it. See, that's the and thing. So, I, I, we've seen the way that she conducted uh, uh, your previous trial before this one and the way she conducted their trial. And uh, she she was just as politicized as the rest of these people in the Justice Department. Uh, she couldn't do anything, in my opinion. Her hands were tied once this whistleblower's information came out because uh, her 
uh, her integrity as well as uh, she could be convicted for the criminal actions if she went on with that in the face of the whistleblower stuff. But she seems to try to be uh, still uh, trying to walk this line to satisfy her political masters and not releasing uh, Todd Engel and Greg Burleson. Yeah, so I'm I'm calling on the the grand jury uh, uh, jurors and the trial jurors in their trial, and I want them to come forth and I want to show them this evidence that was withheld from them and then publicly ask them if that evidence would have made the difference. Because I, I believe there's no question. I believe that they would have saw all the things that the BLM agents were doing, the cover-up, the FBI, the snipers, the beating of the people, you know, the plans of conspiracy of what to do with the people. I mean, I believe they were able to see all that, that both the grand jury so the grand jury never would have indicted, and we never would have had to gone through this. And the trial jury in Greg and, and Todd's trial would have acquitted on all charges. I'm convinced of that. So I want to bring them forth in a, some type of public setting, show them this information, and then say, how do you feel about this? Was the, was the court just in doing what they did? Were the prosecutors right? And how do you feel that you were deceived? Well, that's very important. And I think the other thing that could happen, too, is uh, I think if we could get a social media campaign going, because President Trump does a lot on social media. Uh, He has spoken directly to the public there on numerous uh, issues. Uh, There's been uh, several reports and papers that he's considering a pardon of the Hammonds. Uh, That's another great injustice that we don't have time to talk Mm -hmm. about today. But you and uh, LaVoy Finnegan and your brother and others went up there to try to draw attention to what was going on there. Uh, as uh, the federal judge, uh, the federal government went after these individuals for something that was not a crime uh, that was dismissed by the local people. Uh, but they're still in jail as well. But it looks like there's some talk within uh, the Trump administration about a pardon for them. Certainly, if we could uh, get tweets at President Trump or maybe send letters to the White House. You know, not many people, people talk about it all the time, but not many people take the time to actually write their government officials. So when you do... You don't have to write a long uh, treatise to lay everything out because they're not necessarily going to read it, but they are going to log the fact that somebody is concerned about this issue. And this is, you know, they're on this side of this issue, and we've gotten 2,000 letters on this issue. That will get their attention. Don't you agree, uh, Ammon? Yes, it will. Um, I think it's a sad state that we have to go to the president of the United States for all our issues, even inside our little counties. It but is. at this point, that's what we have to do because he's the one that can relieve us. And uh, and so, yeah, and these people need relief. They need – the Hammonds need to go home. You yeah. know, uh, a couple days ago, Stephen Hammond marks his fourth year in prison. Mm. That's and they need to go that's home. Great. It's unjust. And, and let's talk about this because you understand – you and your family understand the bigger picture. I went to Oregon after Lavoie Finnegan was killed. I talked to the people that that uh, you were all on your way to. There was a big meeting. Everybody was talking about the land use issues. These are private property rights. They are just as important as the land rights that you have for your home. But these are property rights in the sense that people can have on one piece of property. They can have water rights. They can have grazing rights. They can have lumber rights. They can have mining rights. Everybody can enjoy those rights all on the same piece of property. So it's not like uh, your family is saying, we own all this land. No, but you have certain property rights that are just as important as uh, people's property rights in the suburbs. And if those rights are taken, then they can take people and kick them off in the suburbs. And I've seen that happen uh, in the suburbs in Washington State as well, because they're moving the boundaries of the national parks out there and taking away suburban homes as well. But tell us about the real issue there. It's not just uh, withholding fees. Your your father did that in protest of the original problem. Talk about the original problem. So the, the original problem, or just so you understand, my family's been there for 143 years now. Yeah. Uh, we've been ranching on that land. We own vested water rights and grazing rights on that land, deeded with the state of Nevada. And the federal government will not recognize those and basically says that the land belongs to them, and so therefore any rights on the land also belongs to them. And that is completely contrary to the Constitution and to all the laws that, bi- that have built uh, this land up to this point. And so they literally are basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to socialize everything. They're trying to take private property and turn it into the state. 
property, yes. in yeah. particular the federal government's property. And then they could lease it back or do whatever they want to do to fully control it, to make money off of it, and to build their organization. But the problem yeah. is, is that it's ours. I mean, right. it's ours to the point where my dad has borrowed money from the bank. It's vested property. He could sell it, trade it, borrow against it, and he has. And yet, and there were over 50 ranchers that in that area, and they ran every single one of them off except for your father uh, using these same types of tactics. And we have seen what they want to do. They called it UN Agenda 21. Now they call it the UN 2030 Agenda. They want everybody off of the rural lands. They want people out of the suburbs. They want to pack everybody into the cities because that's where it is easiest for them to control everyone. That is what is really fundamentally at the bottom of this issue. And the stuff about uh, uh, grazing fees that were withheld, that was a secondary issue. Thank you so much for joining us, Ammon Bundy. And again, you can find them on Facebook, at Bundy Ranch. We need to stand up for these people who have been victimized and wrongfully convicted. Thank you so much, and good luck to you, Ammon. Support good oral health with our one-of-a-kind Super Blue fluoride-free products. InfoWars Life brings you a revolutionary toothpaste blend with iodine and nano silver designed to deliver a powerful clean. Enjoy a minty fresh flavor made with peppermint oil or try our bubblegum flavor. Pair this groundbreaking toothpaste with the Super Blue fluoride-free mouthwash and supercharge your oral health. Our amazing mouthwash features natural oils and ancient ingredients used since aboriginal and biblical times. Instead of containing fluoride, our Super Blue line is loaded with the good halogen iodine and an array of other beneficial compounds that have been hand-selected for their oral health benefits. Super Blue fluoride-free mouthwash and toothpaste are the first and only to contain all of these natural ingredients, xylitol, nano silver, and iodine. Notice the difference with our Super Blue fluoride-free products. Refresh your breath and invigorate your oral health routine at InfoWarsStore.com. That's InfoWarsStore.com.